chapter 7. We're looking at two verses, 13 and 14. Um, we got a headline this morning, as you can tell, uh, from right off the bat. But uh, probably this word, these verses won't sound familiar, but uh, I'm hoping to hit it head on. But uh, let me read something as we get going. All right, when it comes, uh, John McCarthy said this. When it comes to volatile conversation starters, there are few topics as emotionally charged as politics. I think we all agree with that. Um, after all, having a political opinion and the liberty to express that opinion is part of what being American is all about. And uh, since I was a young kid, I, I will tell you this. Um, I, I talked about something similar to this four years ago, and I will four years from now, because there's a certain time uh, every four years where we get worked up. We, we need some reminders. I need some reminders because from a young kid, uh, as a young kid, I, I was always interested in election stuff, politics stuff. I always was. But at some point, I realized uh, my eyes opened up to something. And that was that. It's still echoing. Very awesome. Okay. 
going to go back to God. But God, he responds to that nation by establishing his sovereign authority. And, and here, look here. He says, when I shut up the heavens. See, God is over creation. He's sovereign over what happens. He's sovereign over the rain, whether it rains, whether it doesn't rain. He's sovereign over the locusts, the pestilence that were devouring the land. He is sovereign over it all. He is sovereign over healing that nation. But there was a prerequisite. He says, in my people who are called by my name. Now, who is he referring to? Let's talk about Israel. Israel had a close covenant relationship with God that united them to him. And, they, and I, I believe there's, there's more than one covenant we see in the scripture. At this time, God was working through the nation of Israel. That was who he was choosing to use as his instrument in the world. And he had a special relationship with those people. He says, if my people who are called by my name. Now, notice something here. He, he's not talking about other nations here. He's not talking about those random uh, people that were outside of Israel. He's talking about his special covenant relationship with Israel. God chooses to bless Israel in this situation. Now, how do we apply that to now? And how do we see that misapplied so often? Because it is. See, God can choose to bless any person, any nation he chooses to bless. There is not some given right that just because we do those things, he will. However, that's normally how he operates, is if you return to God, if you go back to him, if you pray to him, if you humble yourself, he is going to bless you. That's how God typically operates. So why is it that this verse is so misapplied in our culture today? Because if you're like me, and you probably are, you've heard this applied to America I don't know how many times, and, and, and probably a lot this week. And is it okay to do that? And the answer is yes and no. And here's why I say that. As I've said many times, we don't take one verse, slap it on a sticker, and take it out of context. We can't. That's misusing the scriptures. That's not how they were intended to be used. They're meant to be used within the context, within the confines of what the subject we're dealing with in the passage of scripture. We need to know what was going on. That's why I said and talked about what all was going on in Israel at that time. Now, I grew up, I heard a lot of sermons on this passage. I heard that America needed revival. I don't know how many times, and this was the answer to it, and I will tell you, America does need it. Other nations also need it as well. But how does this apply here? How do we take these verses, and we're going to look at the rest of 14 in a minute, and apply them today? In our current situation, how do we apply them? Because the truth is, America is not in it. God didn't have a covenant relationship with us as Americans. He did with Israel. However, he does have a covenant relationship with someone. It's actually a large group of people that he has a very covenant relationship with. It is you and I, who are Christians today. It's his church. That is who God has covenanted a relationship with today. Galatians 3 says, <coughs> if, if, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Though God has not made a specific covenant with our nation, he has with you and I, if you are a Christian today. He has with his church. And that is why I truly believe the spiritual state of the church in our nation is the key to the blessings of the nation as a whole. One author, he said this, the church is ultimate. Now our individual churches will come and go, yet Christ's church, the church, the universal church, will remain. It will prevail against partisan politics, the rage of the nations, and hell itself. The church. That's where the action is at. I've said so often, this is where the God does his best work, is right here in the church. Is he changing
changes and transforms lives. He, he, he not only saves you, but he equips you to live a godly Christian life dedicated to him. And he doesn't leave you just to figure that out by himself. You, you have the word here in front of you, right in front of us this morning. This is where the action is at. It's in the church. Now second, I think this is important to see as well. He says, when I shut up heaven so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people are called by my name, humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Christians repent on a regular basis. Now, God requires four things of his people. If we're going to be a repenting people, here, here's what they are. First, as you see there in the verse, we must humble ourselves. I'll put these up here for you as well. They must humble themselves. James 4, 6, 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's a call to do away with self-reliance. It's a call to know that we are dependent on God. We are, we are humble enough to come before him and say, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I need you. Second, they must pray. Seems obvious, but this is one of the most fundamental truths of our faith. It's why 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, pray without ceasing. We must remember that because of Christ, we have full access to God at any time, anywhere. We don't have to go to someone else. We don't have to, I, I, you don't have to come to me and then I pray for you, which I do enjoy doing. However, you don't have to. You can be right there praying right now in your seat. You have full, unrestricted access to God because of Christ. Third, he says in our passage, they must seek God. It's a call to make pleasing Christ your number one goal in life. Uh, we've talked about that a lot in Ephesians as well. Uh, the people of Israel had turned their backs on God. They were living for themselves. They were living for the, the temporary, the, the things that would not provide lasting fulfillment to them. He says, seek after me. 2 Corinthians, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And then fourth, they must turn from their wicked ways. They must cease from doing evil. They must cease from only living for themselves. This is a call to repent. 1 John 1, 9. One of the most encouraging passages in the scriptures. It says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the path of the Christian. This is the way of the believer. As we commit our ways to him, as we seek, as we've learned in Ephesians, to put off the old man, to put on the new man that is like Christ, we will live a life of repentance where we say and recognize, God, I've been living the wrong way. I've been doing what the old man would do, and now I want to live after you. I want to live like the new man that is like Christ. It's like a passage in Matthew. Here's how I like to think about it. It says in Matthew 5, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's a wonderful picture of what a hopeful, God-fearing individual, Christian, looks like. And, there, and there's three ways for this. The first one, we see that there is a love for God. You are the light of the world. A love for God is what drives us. A love for then others. A light isn't for itself. It's for others around them. It's a love for God. A love for neighbor. And finally, a light shares something. It shares the light. What is the light that we have? What is the hope we have? It is Christ. It is the gospel. It is remembering that our mission in life is to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
We know that is the ultimate aim of the believer. That is our mission from God to be on. We want others to know there's hope in this world. When things seem dark, when things seem uh, just overwhelming, horrible in this life, we have hope. That is Christ. Jesus gives us hope. So how do we live that out? How do we start developing those relationships so we can share the love of Christ? Here's some tips I have. First one is this. Look for opportunities to help your neighbors. Often that is the avenue best to open the door for sharing the gospel. Start building those relationships with them. It may take sacrifice. You may have to learn and give of your time and energy to learn those individuals, but it's worth it. Be a person of integrity, character. <coughs> I, I can't say I'm a Christian here and not live like it for the rest of the week. It just it doesn't it doesn't work. Share your faith or speak openly about it. Especially this time of year, there just seems to be an openness to that. And then be faithful in and to the local church. And we are on mission together. We are here together because we are committed to the cause of Christ. We want people to know there's a hope beyond ourselves, and we are dedicated to it together. Now, for those who recognize God is sovereign, those who recognize repentance must be a way of life, here's our response. For God's response. Christians rest in God's promises. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, here's God's answer, and I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their we rest in God's promises. That's, that's what it is. That's his promise to us. As we've learned in 1 John 1, 9, God forgives those who repent. There's another truth deal. It's that he will heal their land. And the context, again, is key. Uh, we're talking about the, the healing of the land of Israel, the droughts that had happened, the pestilence, the locusts that had happened. He promises to make things right for those people, and he does. But for us, as we read this and we apply it to the Christian life, it's a promise in knowing that when we repent, when we commit our ways to God, that He is faithful to us. That our, our relationship with Him is a loving, good, faithful relationship that He will give to us and be with us in those moments. God hears the prayers of the repentant. God hears and promises to answer those prayers as best as See, personal repentance is key to change. And that starts with salvation. And, and, and what I mean is, as I've shared multiple times, Christ came, Christ died on that cross, Christ lived a sinless life for you, he was buried and he rose again for you. That is the gospel message in a nutshell. Now you must respond, you must confess your sins to God, you must believe that he did that for you, and you give your life to him. Now, this sounds easy, and I, I say it every week, and you've heard it so many times. Yet, at some point, it has to go from here, because we've heard it. I heard it from a very young, young age, growing up in church. But it's got to move to here. There's got to be a commitment. There's got to be an embracing this message that it's more than just words on a page or words I listen to. It is a life change. It is a commitment to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I no longer live for myself, but I live now for King Jesus. Jesus is King. For the Christian this morning, I have another challenge. Because um, I know, come this week, it can be challenging at times. And I'm sure you've been getting annoyed. I'm sure you've been, you're like me, you've been getting over it for a while now. And it's challenging. Put it in perspective, we're going to grandma's for a little bit this week, so to younger kids, that's all they're thinking about and talking about. They have no idea there's an election this week. But for us, uh, I know we can get worked up. I read things online, probably shouldn't. Um, I know, probably shouldn't either. Uh, uh, but
But I have a few challenges this week, all right, for us all. First one is this. Christians have the freedom to be involved in the political process to the extent that they want to be. Second, Christians should remember that public policies and laws pale in comparison to the need for the gospel. Gospel trumps all. Jesus trumps all. The election will have temporary ramifications, but the gospel has eternal ramifications. We have to remember that. The gospel is supreme. Third, Christians should focus on personal holiness more than politics. Again, MacArthur, he has a good point here. He says, if the church is going to influence a hostile, secular society like the one in which we live, political clout is not what we need. All the power, politics, and public policies in the world will never force unbelievers to yield their hearts to Christ as Lord. Personal holiness, not political dominion, is what causes men to glorify our Father who is in heaven. I think that's important. We must remember the gospel trumps all. The gospel goes forth. That is what we must remember. And then last, Christians, let me put it up there for you, Christians should remember who sits on the throne more than who sits in the White House. Jesus is King. Much like God reminded Israel who he was and their need to repent and come back to him, he still reigns on the throne today. God is sovereign and in control. And I end with this. If I didn't believe God was sovereign, I'd live in fear of the political process, like so many do. Resentment towards the those who disagree, anxiety about the outcome. But God is sovereign. He is sovereign. Your God is sovereign. There is no need to fear. Uh, it's okay to get upset, it, it, but it, it's, there's no need to get worked up. There's no need to worry. There's no need to fear. God is sovereign. God reigns supreme. Your God is in control, and he will use whatever happens on Tuesday or whatever we find out. He will use... That process, as he uses any process in our lives, to sanctify us to become more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I, I thank you for your word and how it challenges us, how it confronts us, how it encourages us. But most of all today, I, I thank you that you are a sovereign, good God. You reign supreme. We're here today for us who are believers because of all that Christ did. We didn't go searching for you. you. You came for us. We didn't just recognize that authority, that, that supremacy that you have. No, you, you made that known to us. You didn't, we didn't go searching your word and just see things that are just randomly and put it all into place. No, you gave us the scriptures. You illuminate you bring these truths into our lives. And after a while, we, we begin to see that it is you who are in charge of it all. You reign supreme. You are sovereign. I pray that this week and every week that we will trust you more. That this will drive us to have a greater desire to know you, to live for you, to, to live faithfully for the cause of Christ. Not only in Newman, but in the world at large. Help us, though. Uh, because we fail a lot. We recognize that we struggle in many of these areas. We, we grumble, we complain, we, we uh, it's just, it, it just hard at times in this sin-cursed world. So I pray for encouragement, for boldness, for courage, for love, for a commitment to persevere to the end until one day we are with you. Remind us this week 